Well, welcome everyone to our June PL Andres All Hands meeting. Um, we have these every month. Shocking that it's already been a month. Um, same agenda as usual. We're going to go through our quick working group update with some of our team updates. Lots of awesome spotlights this time, and then a deep dive into the awesome improvements the Sentinel team has been making to Lily, which is helping everyone have more visibility into um, Falcon Network metrics and monitoring um, and historical uh, information. Quick reminder, if you're new here, um, this is uh, one of the many working groups across the PL network. Um, we focus on engineering and research, aka NDRES. And one of the things that really unites us with the rest of the PL network community um, is a shared belief that the internet is an amazing superpower for all of humanity and that we need to be building a resilient foundation for our information and for um, collaborative tools that utilize the internet so that the amazing phase transition that we are part of as a species gets built upon a robust foundation um, for our information and for kind of like empowering uh, individual data ownership, data privacy, uh, connection between individuals that hopefully can make things like brain machine interfaces and AGI and the future um, breakthroughs that are right around the door uh, actually build upon a better foundation for computing. Um, we do that by um, building and starting and growing and contributing to amazing computing projects. Um, and some of the main ones we contribute to are IPFS, Lapita B, and Falcoin, but we have a number more projects that we uh, we work on and build toward, um, DRAMed, multi-formats, IPLD, um, and many others. Uh, and we think these are making a much more robust foundation for humanities information and uh, enabling of peer-to-peer -peer connectivity um, between individuals. And so our mission for the Endres Working Group is to help scale and unlock new breakthroughs for IPFS, Falcoin, and Lapita P. We do that in three main ways helping drive breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability directly. So working on the technology, um, scaling network native research and development, doing our work in the open, being highly collaborative with many different groups across the PL network and sharing our learnings and discoveries, um, and then stewarding and growing open source projects, networks and communities. So helping um, attract and build up more uh, uh, work within this ecosystem, making our projects open and accessible um, and trying to make building blocks that other people can, um, can harness to um, build amazing projects on top. We are broken up into a number of different teams across the PL Lunches Working Group, um, working across uh, you know, retrieval markets, FVM, compute over data, um, crypto net, consensus, um, data retrieval, data storage, um, and many other areas. This is our 2023 strategy. Um, no changes here. We first and foremost focus on keeping all of the critical systems running smoothly and growing smoothly so that they can scale to new adoption. Um, we work on growing the entire network through hosting um, events, through being um, kind of like accessible uh, stewards that can help train new people in these technologies and being highly collaborative to attract more groups to this ecosystem. Um, and then we have kind of two main focus areas uh, to add a lot more value and utility directly to the, the technologies in the space. First is helping grow robust storage and retrieval across IPFS and Filecoin. Um, and then second is making sure that we can unlock amazing new capabilities on top of um, Filecoin state and Filecoin data um, to make that more accessible to new builders, um, to unlock more utility for data that's been stored in Filecoin, um, and to make sure that we have the chain space within uh, these sorts of networks to um, you know, make space for all of this amazing user programmability. And here's our uh, uh, high level view at some of the breakthroughs across IPFS and Filecoin that we're working on, categorized by some of those different um, growth areas. Um, and uh, we're, we're heavily in focus on um, some of the, the new breakthroughs coming, but definitely continue to build on the successes that have happened earlier in this year, especially things like FDM um, and some of the, the early launches of Saturn, which are um, setting us up with uh, an amazing community of builders who are building on top of Filecoin and an amazing set of node operators in Saturn who can help us um, convert some of the, the first clients to this network as well. Um, and then of course, we continue to do a lot of work across um, IPFS, Filecoin, and other um, uh, networks to help with things like network upgrades or new versions that can support new capabilities. Two exciting um, new upgrades that are in the works for people to be looking forward to that are kind of like uh, hovering at the end of this quarter. Um, one is the IPC MVP actually being deployed on Falcon mainnet. Um, the, the consensus lab team has been making awesome progress here, working with some builders um, 
uh, elsewhere in the ecosystem as well, having Solidity smart contracts being built for IPC that can then be deployed on FEM and enable the docking of the IPC testnet spacenet with Filecoin mainnet. So that's a very exciting uh, milestone that we're, we're all working towards right now. Um, and then a, a big endeavor as well is the collaboration between the Saturn team, the IP stewards team, the Bedrock team, the Bifrost team, and a number of other groups to help uh, the IPFS gateway transition to using Saturn as a decentralized um, you know, CDN for uh, uh, fetching and serving retrieval requests for data across IPFS and Filecoin nodes to um, uh, all of the, the users who are trying to fetch content from the IPFS gateway. And so that's a big, big endeavor that um, we are continuing to, to push on um, and, and push towards uh, completing that first client use case for Saturn, um, which is very exciting. Some, some exciting progress on some of these big bets that we're pushing towards across the whole PL interest uh, working group and the you know, various communities that we're a part of as well. Um, exciting update. Sorry to steal Jennifer's thunder, but we have crossed an exabyte of total data uh, stored in Filecoin across these uh, you know, 1,500 plus clients, um, including SETI, Internet Archive, Solana, CERN, and many other groups who are now storing large data on Filecoin. It's been really amazing to see how the um, you know, Filecoin data storage pipeline has uh, continued to grow. Uh, we're now hitting I think I think it was 5.9 petabytes like earlier on Monday this week. Uh, so we're almost about to hit six petabytes of data being onboarded per day, which is pretty pretty freaking impressive. Um, really a, a huge uh, chunk of progress in upgrading the technology, in improving data onboarding tooling, in storage providers really tuning their data onboarding pipelines, in new clients um, hearing about and being attracted to the this ecosystem to um, bring their useful data to the space. And so that's pretty, pretty exciting in terms of that big bet to really make sure that Falcon is a great home for humanity's most important information. Um, a lot of our work is going right now into Saturn as a Web3 CDN and helping that um, scale fast retrievals of data on Filecoin. Um, so we have, you know, uh, 2.5 thousand uh, CDN nodes or points of presence around the world. We're now having uh, over 200,000 successful retrievals per week from Lassie. And we have over 10, I think, um, different storage provider clients that have 100% retrieval success rate. Um, and so we're really, we're starting to see that come together as a, a major way of accessing and retrieving data from the network. Um, in terms of compute over data, harnessing the awesome breakthrough of FDM um, so that we can bring um, you know, larger compute networks to make all of the, the data in Filecoin even more useful um, and help bring additional data, you know, the output of those compute jobs to Filecoin as well. Um, we saw Bacaliao hit 1.0, which we talked about last time. Um, and we have uh, deployed smart contracts on top of FDM that are making compute available to um, clients within the Falcon virtual machine, specifically through Water Lily, which is you know, doing uh, stable diffusion and generated images. Um, and those groups are also investigating things like interplanetary consensus to help scale their compute networks um, as L2s with things like faster block times or more specific incentive systems um, for each of those kind of more differentiated compute networks. And we expect there to be a huge plethora of these networks um, that are optimizing for different parts of the compute space. Um, and in IPC, uh, there's been awesome progress in getting IPC deployed and then gearing up for SpaceNet to dock with Falcon Mainnet, which is the next milestone the team's pushing for here. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of work making sure that we're approaching strategic decision-making about how to um, support future IPC subnets with the right sort of node tooling um, and that we're, you know, predicting the sorts of use cases, be that um, compute networks or um, regional sharding retrieval networks or Web3 gaming um, or other uh, use cases that would want to build on top of Filecoin, um, build on top of a uh, flexible scaling solution that, that helps scale all of these use cases and attract them um, to, to the Filecoin ecosystem with smooth interoperability with storing their data in Filecoin, having all of their data be IPLB, uh, content addressed uh, and um, and kind of like you know bringing bringing all of that utility and usage to the Falcon ecosystem as well. And I'll hand it off to each of our leads to give a quick update on our OKRs for Q2, which we have about about a month left in. 
Thanks, Molly. Um, on keep critical systems running and secure, um, the first KR was unlocking IPFS reader privacy via double hashing for our major content routing mechanisms, namely DHT and IPNI. On the IPNI side, we have all data for SID contact. Our um, the most used IPNI node is serving data via double hash store. So that's great on the reader privacy side. On the DHT side, we recognized we were not going to meet um, the KR and rephrased it to deliver a publicly shared roadmap for DHT improvements, which will include a composable DHT and reader privacy, and that's in the works. And then also doing the necessary prep work to refactor um, GoLib PDP, Kademlia DHT, and wire it into Boxo Kubo. So stay tuned there. And then um, on the Filecoin side, we landed two network improvements, FIP60 and FIP61, for um, making the chain much more uh, stable. And we are not going to be doing another network upgrade within this quarter. So those will be the two. Meanwhile, the team is focusing on profiling the chain to uncover any other issues they should be aware of. Great. Yeah, thanks. And so with hyperscaling and accelerating the talent and teams contributing to the PL stack uh, with the completion of the consensus day uh, event, we've now executed on four distinct events. So well done to all involved there. Um, in terms of attendance and async views, we haven't hit the targeted amounts of reach yet, um, which is why this is not green or marked as complete. Um, and then in terms of the second item, uh, around around Boxo, uh, we're not aware yet of Boxo fully boosting other IPFS implementations outside of Endres. Uh, we you know we haven't done the proactive reach outs of onboarding others that we originally planned. We have been giving some white glove treatment to outer core engineering, but not sure if that's going to be landing in this quarter or not. There are 130 plus packages depending on Boxo, uh, many of which are outside of Endres, but we really just haven't gotten to analyzing which of those we'd classify as IPFS implementations. So this uncertainty is why this is marked as yellow, but you know certainly continuing to deliver functionality there, um, especially as requested and needed by projects like RIA and within Endres. Thanks, Steve. I'll um, take it on the data retrievals from CDNs. So um, on the first KR here, if you all know from the Saturn decentralized CDN project, the KR we were initially aiming to hit was five customers onboarded this quarter. And if you recall last time we were updating in this forum, we were at two and trending towards three. And so you might be wondering why now we're saying 1.5 and why, well, I don't look as grumpy as I normally do and you would expect me to look grumpy. So uh, the purpose of getting these first real world customers is of course to validate and hone in and making sure the system was working properly for them. As you can see in the second KR here, I've had a bit slight regression in the retrieval success from Saturn. Now the team is made a strategic decision to pause development on new integrations and really focus in on making sure that the Raya integration is working perfectly, humming along beautifully so that we can nail those KPIs and make sure that those initial customers are happy. So there is some really heroic work going on in here, both from the entire Saturn team, which is now focused in on this, as well as the entire decentralized gateway working group. Um, you can follow along in the public decentralized gateway working group Slack channel on the Filecoin Slack if you want to see all of the fun and drama of this exciting endeavor, debugging a very complex system. But we believe that we are we, this is the correct decision and we are moving in the right direction towards getting into a system behaving the way that we believe it should uh, and really making our users happy ultimately. Um, on the third KR here, the, the, of course, we are looking to one of the reasons we're looking to do this is to reduce our centralized web to infrastructure costs uh, by switching over there. Um, we do have a lot of positive news here. Um, so in addition, or sorry, in advance of Raya being up in public, uh, Daghouse gateways for DWeb Link have already implemented uh, in production such that when we make that switch over, 85% of Elastic IPFS bit swap traffic is going to move over to HTTP traffic, which is going to, we believe, decrease the variable cost by byte, actually 85%. Um, and simultaneous to this, while it is not related to the rollout, it would be remiss to not call out the amazing reductions in centralized infrastructure costs that both of these teams have made. Uh, Daghouse recently cut $30,000 a month on the gateways there. And we have a lot of other projects in motion, both on the Daghouse team and the NOPS team that we expect to see significant returns on in the coming weeks. Uh, go turn it over to you, Aisan, for exciting updates from the Filecoin L2 and Computer for Data Land.
Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu, for uh, giving context into all of them. Super exciting to hear um, all the upcoming progress. Uh, on the last OKR, upgrading Falcon with new L2 capabilities, shareable chain space and compute over data. On FAM land, uh, we have great news uh, right before, while we are marching towards the end of this quarter, we met the uh, original OKRs that we have set. Um, we are uh, close to 2.4, I think as of today, it might be even close to 2.5 million fill, uh, managed through FAM contracts, um, over one, uh, 1K unique uh, smart contracts deployed. It's around 1100, close to 1100. And we are at 90K wallets as of today. This is the only one that you might be a little lagging behind and we might be able to meet by end of this quarter, but the team is putting all the effort to make it easy for uh, FEM entry points. So hopefully uh, we will accelerate that growth there. Uh, on IPC side, IPC M1 launched, as you all know by now, and M2 is entering to audits. Uh, on, and on Bacalao COD, we met, uh, we met our uh, OKR for this quarter, earlier this quarter with uh, 1.0 launch. With that, I will uh, hand it off to Molly. Awesome. And I will hand it off to IPFS folks to give us uh, updates there. Cool. All right. Yeah, this will be me again. Uh, so talking about IPFS, making the web work peer-to-peer -peer with content addressing so content can be verified independent of the provider or transport method. Uh, so on the next slide here are KPIs. Um, so a couple of things want to call out. So that from top left slide you know, is network size, but again, this is only the quote public IPFS DHT. We are tracking about how to expand to other uh, sets of nodes, um, but no major call-outs want to make there or in the GitHub community activity. On the right-hand side about network performance, where we're looking at time to first provider record, thanks to some work that just recently landed by the ProBlab team, we're also looking at performance at, you know, external um, client side, um, performance around IPNI, CID contact. And uh, so, yeah, and so that's even getting broken out now by you know, cached and uncached results. So this again just landed. We don't have a long history of this, and may, there's maybe some kinks to work out, but this was something we'll be reporting on as one of the other content routing uh, mechanisms within the network. So in terms of some updates of what happened over the last month on the Helia, our IPFS and JavaScript implementation that we've been pouring into, uh, an important migration guide for the JS IPFS deprecation got completed, and it took on a, a important libp to JS libp2p update, which has some of the new uh, uh, transports like web transport and WebRTC on by default. And the team has also been leaning in on HackFS participation. I don't have any of the numbers yet, but we we're really using this as an opportunity to see what is and isn't working for people with Helia. So more to come on that, I'm sure, for yeah, during our next update. In the Go side of the world with Kubo and, and Boxo, uh, there was a new Boxo release that was just cut, and that'll be moving into the Kubo RC, which is expected for Monday. Uh, but some user requested things around error, friendly error pages and being able to uh, you know, display and traverse a DAG Seaboard previews. That's all there. The streaming support in our delegated HTTP routing v1 API is there and some kind of long-standing resiliency items of events that heard, hit us earlier in Q1. We've finally gotten to actually fully addressing those and those will be coming out. I want to give a shout out to a cross org effort with uh, pro, uh, sorry with Little Bear Labs. They've been leveraging trustless gateways. Uh, we now have a small patch set of changes that you can add to any Chromium-based browser, which will add IPFS protocol handling. And so there's proof of concepts that you can use. Um, and it's, again, it's quite minimal for anyone who's using Chromium to, to add this in. So we're excited to see where that goes. And shout out to Probe Lab. Some of their measurement work has been getting uh, picked up in, in other places. In terms of things coming, the uh, what's been referred to as IPIP402, which is around partial car support and trustless gateways, particularly needed by RIA, that should be going out to tomorrow um, in, you know, in Boxo, and that'll be able to get picked up by Kubo Boost and by Frost Gateway and anyone else that wants it. And a key thing here is that it will have accompanying uh, gateway conformance tests. So we're excited to be holding that kind of standard. Uh, more routing uh, V1 improvements, as you can see, including IPNS and peer, peer routing. A major refactoring of the IPFS companion due to browser changes with MV3. It will be launching over the next month. We've got a, our second beta is out there, and we'd certainly welcome feedback before we push this out to you know, many thousands of users. And the, yeah, there is a lot of work going on right now on the ghost side of the world for DHT refactoring, preparing us for other work to come. So that's that's what I'll share there. Thanks. I think yeah, next we're into IPDX, and I, we got a video to play. IPDX has been working tirelessly to enhance our processes and workflows. 
Recently, we've submitted four great talk proposals for GitHub Universe 2023. Each focuses on diverse yet essential aspects such as managing GitHub configuration as code and monitoring GitHub actions. We've ramped up security by implementing secret scanning and push protection across protocol labs. We're also proud to announce that we've enabled code scanning in selected repositories, aiming to extend this across the organization soon. In terms of collaboration, our team has provided key support to the libp2p team to automate their performance testing. We've also set up protocol labs, self-hosted GitHub Actions runners for the IPNI project. We've introduced several enhancements to gateway conformance, including the car check API, DNS link support, and more. Looking ahead, we aim to fully implement code scanning across protocol labs, migrate remaining gateway tests to a more efficient framework, and continue to improve our operations while reducing costs. We're excited for what's to come and appreciate your support as we forge ahead. Awesome. Thank you, uh, AI TikTok uh, delightedness. Uh, and I really get to appreciate all of the amazing work the DX team is doing. Over to Luke P. Thank you, Molly, for that kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> we don't have AI here at LibP2P. We just worry about the plumbing that powers everything else uh, being built around here. So I wanted to highlight um, some of our KPIs. Uh, we had feedback last month that we should be showing IPFS in here yeah, in our, our unique node count uh, graph. Previously, we hadn't included it because it's generally much larger than all of the other networks and it tends to squish everything down at the bottom um but we were requested so we're gonna we're gonna add it here so that you can see the total numbers um uh, and for transparency's sake one of the things i want to point out is that when we went to update the numbers for june we noticed that there is a sharp drop off in numbers and that we're certain is due to the number collection system having some issues that we're looking into right now. We have some action items about that, but I can assure you these numbers are not reflective of reality. <laughs> it's also early in June. Well, the report out for June is for the previous month. So um, the other thing I wanted to point out on the community GitHub activity, um, after previously reporting a sharp drop off, drop off in April, we're back live and excited again. We now have confirmed that IPFS thing causes a sharp decline in our metrics. You can see back in July in 2022, 20, uh, we had a sharp decline and then we were all at IPFS thing in April of 2023. So we're calling this the IPFS phenomenon. Um, it's mostly because the entire community shows up there. <laughs> so some highlights on what happened in the last month. Uh, we added a new team member, Sukun Tereshindani, who's uh, out of India. We're really excited to happen uh, to have him on the team. If you missed his intro, I would like to quickly highlight that he started as a volunteer reviewing po uh, peer re uh, pull requests in January. And then in March, I believe he was given a small Filecoin grant to do some key work in the Go Lib P2P team. And now he has joined the Lib P2P team as a full on member. So the the rags to riches story from community volunteering to being a, a paid contributor uh, in a project uh, is true in some cases. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on performance and metrics. We have a dashboard preview up there. Um, the it will continue to improve over the next few weeks, uh, and we hope to do a broader. Um, introduction to it so that you can read it and understand it. The TLDR on all of this is that quick is awesome. And uh, it's going, well, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, I think the thing I'm most excited about this month is that we're seeing a strong community uh, engagement now. Numbers are going up across the board. We're seeing um, lots of contribu contributions from outside organizations. Here's a brief list here of some key ones. The one I want to highlight the most is the JVM, the Java version of libp2p. Uh, has been very active over the last month. It's a collaboration between cons Consensus and Peergos. And um, there's a long list of closed PRs from the last uh, month that you can look at there. Um, let's see, we 
been doing our community calls as usual. The last one we had 15 plus attendees. We have multiple orgs. That's also a sign of good health for an open source project. And we're currently right in the middle of the HackFest Lib P2P Hackathon. Um, I'm most proud that we have six mentors hanging out in there that we recruited from across the project. The other things that I really want to highlight are that Quick is definitely becoming our favorite transport of choice. Martin did some Herculean effort over the last uh, month, landing all the quick changes into the Go's crypto TLS. And uh, that's going to help us improve a lot of the latency issues with our um, with um, lib P2P connections. And then also later today, Marco will be doing a lib P2P from ground up. It's the very first deep dive or the deep end, I should say. Um, so look for that later today. Awesome. Over to Jennifer. Um, for Alcoin, we focus on getting data in, data out, and hopefully getting data computed on top of this distributed uh, storage network. Some very quick uh, Falcon network KPIs and the total network storage capacity is around still around like 12 uh, exabytes. It's run by power. Uh, as you can see, it's still like not growing as uh, fast as we usually do. But that is because uh, the sector that's onboarded again from two, three years ago are starting to get expired. Uh, I should have included a graph here, the daily sector onboarding is still around six pip um, per day. So we are getting new storage committed to the network um, still on a daily basis. Uh, out of the six pip per day, five pip uh, out of six pip are actually real data stored in Filecoin deals. Uh, as Wally mentioned um, earlier that there are over, we, we passed one exabyte of data stored on Filecoin. I share the link over there. You can see how, uh, what are the data sets on Filecoin, but that's very exciting. Uh, some quick Filecoin highlights. I forgot to include that, but I do want to uh, give a shout out that Lotus team um, field dev, we, we welcomed a couple new team members to our team as well. Uh, Mike, uh, we steal from Core Engineering, now is officially joining the Lotus Actor team, and we also get Andy uh, included in our team that's going to help uh, implementing, improving Lotus Manor as the software. Um, some um, project updates over here. The proof team has published some new releases that including unsealing fit, uh, unsealing fix, and also better APIs for unsealing. So it's going to be easier for uh, a search possible now, and it's getting in integrated into Lotus Manor. It will be included in our next release uh, on their way to search providers. Um, this is a great uh, effort by Alex and the community contributor called Alex um, Alex Xu. And they have landed a uh, um, deal activation optimization, um, and they improved that by 25%. So if you have heard, PSD has been a huge cost uh, for storage provider when, get, uh, when getting data on board to the Filecoin network, and we are trying to get that cost down a little bit. By a little bit, I mean a lot. Um, but, but but this optimization just landed. It's waiting for governance process to include it in the next uh, network upgrade. We also have uh, implemented uh, optimized uh, historical data access using a Lotus node. This is a new user requirement on the Lotus node uh, since FEVM launch because now we are having applications want historical chain data. Uh, um, way more historical, like the graph nodes, sushi swap, like DAX and all those things. Um, and we have now implemented that thanks to Frederick from FVM team. Uh, Lotus uh, Miner team has been, again, consuming all the improvement from the proof team and hopefully optimize uh, how fast uh, we can serve uh, retrievals uh, uh, with the Boost team. Uh, for Filecoin, we are also joining the fact, uh, HackFS. There's a lot of uh, track going on, FEM, IPC, Saturn, all very exciting. Do check it out. Uh, and also, I just learned Saturn payout is now on FEM, so that's very cool. Um, uh, some opportunities there are, we are, again, we are trying to, we keep want to look into how we can bring the computation or the gas cost down uh, for like getting data or like storage on top of Filecoin. So a proof team has been doing a lot of benchmark from the snark pack uh, for snap deals. Basically, we can aggregate in the computation, um, uh, but also um, collaboration with Super Nationals, which is an ecosystem um, partner, has been doing a lot of software uh, optimizations. Uh, we are also, Lotus Manor team is also on track of 
uh, integrating things that are pull wrap uh, and mm, getting it ready for MV21, the network upgrade, uh, so that again, folks can save more storage spaces between PC2 and C1, I believe, uh, but like save some storage spaces so a ceiling pipeline can be more uh, robust. Uh, and also uh, in collaboration with Consensus Lab, uh, we started to talk to their engineers uh, about uh, some IPC client discussions, um, uh, what the implementation should look like. It's still early uh, stage uh, from our side on uh, exploration, but that's very exciting. I think that's it. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's uh, keep it quick, but let's go into some of our quick team updates and then our spotlights and deep dive, starting with Bedrock. Hi, everyone. Uh, David, engineering manager on Bedrock. As a reminder, we work at the intersection of Filecoin and IPFS. A uh, few key highlights to share. Uh, boost adoption is going strong. We're almost at 50% of all Lotus market nodes, which is exciting. Uh, also, our indexing coverage for Filecoin deals is over 50% per week. So we should be seeing that number go up on the overall number of deals uh, indexed on IPNI. Uh, a few project highlights over the last few months. Uh, first off, IPNI, as mentioned earlier, is storing all of the index in double hash format. This helps our privacy preserving efforts. Um, the team is also uh, rolling out a new scalability solution that leverages Foundation DB that we're really excited about. Um, the Boost team uh, has added functionality to serve files over HTTP uh, with Booster HTTP. There's a few blog posts linked there. Uh, take a look. And the Tornado team added HTTP retrieval support uh, in Lassie uh, with uh, initial integration with dot storage, making sure that's working well for the Rea project. Um, so in terms of what's coming next, uh, the IPNI team is going to continue to stabilize that new infrastructure uh, with Foundation DB. Boost team is working on scalability improvements with the Lotus team, as mentioned by Jenny, as well as migrating to a new database uh, for retrieval scalability. And the Lassie work stream will continue in, in making improvements uh, for the Rea project with all of the uh, different retrieval parts of Saturn as well, and, and improving that success rate in the long run. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick, for Retrieval Markets. Hey there, Patrick here from the Retrieval Markets team. Uh, first update is from the station uh, team where they've been building something called Spark. This is a, a retrieval checker module. It's currently making retrievals against uh, Saturn, but soon storage providers. Um, we've actually got a slide in the spotlights on this, so I won't go into too much detail, uh, but we've had 600k retrievals already performed. The, uh, the Saturn team, uh, they have been focusing on Raya pretty much uh, completely. And the Raya M1 milestone is for us to get to the IPFS gateway correctness and latency with 10% of production traffic. We're getting close, but we're still a few iterations away from this goal, uh, pulling it all together. Saturn in general, though, we've got over 2,000 nodes now running uh, point to presence, which is super cool. Um, the Saturn goes Web3 working group, as we've already heard. Uh, has shipped a Saturn payout contract on FVM. And we're, again, we're going to hear a bit more about that in the spotlights uh, from Amin, who was uh, working on that project. And then across the PLN teams, Magmo is now working with Boost uh, on multi-hot payment channels, which is really cool. Uh, and Titan, who is uh, another sort of Saturn-style network uh, based out in China, they've launched a testnet for their DCDN. And I think they're, they're integrating with FVM and also with IPC subnets. Uh, so doing some really cool stuff. Now, opportunities, there is a bounty available at HackFS for the most impactful application on Saturn and IPNI. Uh, I think that started off yesterday. Uh, and Spark and reputation data, well, I'll come back to that one again in the spotlights. And there's an open role in our team. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Max Kryptonet. Uh, yeah, so um, we have this work by Kuba. Uh, so Falcon Data Tools integrated proof of data segment inclusion to enable verifiable data aggregation in Delta. Uh, then we have a bunch of docs uh, that we updated in the last uh, few weeks. So we have the synthetic power of security audit report uh, and then the C sectors upgrade. So as you know, with FIP 19, with Snap deal, it is possible to inject data into CC sectors. Uh, yeah, the TLDR is that upgrading CC sectors looks like the best options uh, for SPs. Uh, then we have storage faults mode, um, and then like an overview on the proof of space time uh, security model. Uh, and then I'd like to mention the proof of space.org website. Uh, the goal there is really to onboard researchers and engineers into the space. And we have July 20 and 21 in Paris 
there's going to be an event uh, focused on that. Uh, and then we have this Falcon observability proposal um, and mainly the SPRI calculator by Nicola, uh, which is part of that. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. And Eric for DRAND. Right on. Hi, everybody. Um, DRAND here, the ultimate randomness solution. I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. I've got lots of links here for you, but uh, the highlights I'd like to call out. The League of Entropy, which is our uh, consortium of other volunteer organizations that's contributing to our Threshold Crypto Network is healthy and growing. Uh, we've added three new members this quarter, um, and we've received some significant expressions of interest from a variety of large and interesting customers, uh, potential potential customers such as um, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Ubisoft, Meisten Labs. Uh, we've created uh, a lot of new material for in preparation for HackFS. Uh, so we have some great resources uh, for beginner hackers as well as more experienced folks who will be joining us for that for that day. We have a, a, a bounty like many of the teams do uh, for DRAND use cases. And um, speaking of use cases, we've got a voluminous sort of product market fit document that defines several use cases. For those of you that are more business inclined, um, would love for you to come check that out and give us some feedback. Uh, we recently had an accept, a fit that was accepted uh, for uh, onboard, onboarding Filecoin to the Unchained network. So that was very exciting. Um, we also have some work. We've got an in, a new intern um, who I uh, should have introduced here. I just realized I forgot to include her, her name and introduction here, but uh, she'll be joining us to work on DKG refactoring. Um, all of our KPIs are awesome. As you can see, they're, we're all at 100% uptime. We've got 2 billion requests, legitimate requests each month. And um, we've got a dashboard there for those that want to double click. Um, we also managed to uh, repel some spammers who did an incorrect implementation and were at one point they were spamming the network with 80% of the API calls, which was really nasty. So uh, working with ProBlab and some of those folks on that stuff. And then um, opportunity wise, uh, we're really excited because not only have we had lots of new customers integrate DRAND into their products and services, but we've also received some expressions of interest uh, from a variety of different clients primarily in the gaming space. Um, and so we're investigating some of those use cases. And um, we will be, of course, with many of you at ETHCC and uh, Blockchain Oracle Summit in Paris in, a, in about a month or so. And so look forward to seeing everybody there. Thanks so much. Awesome. Great work, Duran team. Let's head over to our spotlight, starting with Nikki from HackFS. Hi, everyone. I have an exciting update from Hackathon Land from Outer Core Founders team for y'all. Last Friday, we kicked off our fourth annual three-week flagship virtual hackathon, HackerFest 2023 with eGlobal. global uh, We have 820 registered hackers, and the total prizes add up to a whooping $150,000, of which $60,000 are from Protocol Labs, spread out across all the teams you see listed on the right. Over 90 projects have already checked in with their progress reports and blockers. So all the teams that are supporting the hackathon, do head over to your dashboard and check those uh, projects out. You can also contact them on Discord with the information listed over there. Coming up next are project feedback sessions for hackers and live hackathon judging. Uh, so if you'd like to be a hackathon judge, sign up using the link listed in the slide. And a huge, huge, huge thanks to Andres and all the teams for the awesome support for HackFS. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Patrick for Spark. Hi there, me again. Um, so Spark, uh, yeah, this is the, the first module which the station team is working on. Uh, the idea here is to do two things. One is to get to the first station module that gives people payouts. And secondly, to make some progress on the retrieval incentives and retrieval reputation space uh, against storage providers. So the idea is that stations, of which we have now 100 10 around the world uh, will be running uh, periodic retrievals against storage providers and measuring them and then storing them. And then eventually they'll be rewarded uh, for, for doing these jobs. Um, so far, we've been hitting the Saturn network as a first step. And while, we, and while we've been doing that, uh, we've integrated Lassie into Zinnia. Uh, and so we can now uh, hit the SPs using all the hard work on Lassie. Um, the next step is to actually create this thing we call Meridian, uh, which stands for Measure, Evaluate, Reward, uh, the MER. And Meridian is uh, the, the Measure, Evaluate, Reward is Impact Evaluator terminology. We want to create an Impact Evaluator whereby 
not only station, but also the work we've done on Saturn uh, to reward people for their jobs. It becomes part of a framework where you can just plug in to, to measure a certain job in the network. You then get evaluated and then you get rewarded by the smart contract. Uh, and that works kicking off uh, as, we be, as we speak. Thank you. Steve, for JSF Invest application. Yeah, it's great. So JSF Invest right, has a long history here at PL with lots of exploration and lessons learned, many of which have now moved into Helia. And so over the last month, the Helio Working Group has taken on doing the work of actually deprecating JSIPFS. So, you know, first, a lot of planning that went into doing this before we started disrupting and upending people's lives. And, and then involved a lot of uh, documenting, communicating in terms of blog entries, uh, migration guide, which we've got a lot of positive uh, feedback on. And then it was like enter into execution and disruption. So the, the team like went through one by one about 370 uh, GitHub issues and PRs, uh, often you know, denoting whether that has been solved in Helio or is not going to be addressed, et cetera. So I've done all of that work. So just using this as an opportunity to celebrate the maintainership that went into setting something down gracefully, and ideally all the time and dev confusion that we've can save by reducing some of the surface area that we're getting out of Helio. So big, big thanks to those who came before us, many of which who are still here, but in different parts of the org, certainly to Alex, Russell, and Ashant who did the lifting here, and uh, and Outer Core, uh, and folks participating in HackFS that have already been giving feedback on how to make this better. You know, we aren't done, done, done yet. Uh, there is doc cleanup that needs to occur around IPFS docs, the js.ipfs.io website, and even ProtoSchool. Um, so those are being tracked and we'll do those and certainly going to be uh, actively improving Helia as a result of the feedback we're getting. Uh, but we will archive the repo at the end of this week uh, so that no new issues start showing up in JSIPFS. So again, thanks all for your, your help to get us to this point. Awesome. I mean, Hello, everyone. I'm Amin, one of the engineers on Saturn. And uh, as you may have heard already, we're very excited to announce that Saturn has just deployed decentralized payouts via mm -hmm. FEM smart contracts. Um, what does this mean? It means that now Saturn node operators get their rewards locked to their Falcon address in an FEM smart contract, and they have the ability to query or claim their earnings, as well as have access to a dedicated on-chain record of their Saturn reward transactions. Um, we just launched in the beginning of June and it was a very successful launch. Already 75% of the network has, has claimed their earnings. And to our knowledge, we are the first uh, decentralized CDN to, uh, to, uh, to release a decentralized payouts mechanism in this space. So it's kind of cool, but honestly not surprised that we're leading the frontier in that area. Um, so as, as part of our tooling, we developed a CLI and a web application for our node operators to claim. You can see some lovely pictures of that on the slide. And uh, one cool thing about our CLI is that it offers end-to-end -end Falcon native functionality, meaning that um, you can do everything with deploying, claiming, inspecting your earnings without the need for an Ethereum address, and you can use that uh, to interact with the FEM. Um, so everything we've worked on is open source and public, and we really tried our best to generalize the tooling um, that we worked on so that any team that wants to deploy their own re like a reward distribution mechanism, FEM, can uh, leverage the tooling that we have built. And of course, we're, we'd love to chat about that if, uh, if anyone is interested. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Great work. George. All right. My turn now. So yeah, just very briefly going over Consensus Days 23, which we organized this Monday and, and Tuesday. It was the third edition of Consensus Days, except if you're really old at PO, in which case it was the fourth one because there was a, a old event at one point together with the SBC. But, but yeah, but so we, we did it in 21 as a virtual event in 22 as an in-person event in, in LA and now uh, back to virtual. And yeah, it was we i think we we continued the, the 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 good trend of the previous editions we had a whole lot of very interesting talks we had 20 accepted uh, talks out of 35 submissions plus two invited talks one from Hagevos, so the chief scientist of of iohk ioj cardano and and jarko the the cto of of informal systems but we have participation from all across the industry and all across uh, academia in europe the us and and asia pacific as well uh, other numbers 231 registrations uh, for this year's events uh, we have been using uh, the consensus channel uh, over time for all of this so that's up to 347 and our mailing list of participants is now up to 612 members uh, so people who participated in this or previous editions the youtube videos aren't up yet we just have the raw streams from from uh, that you know captured the whole event those have been viewed 614 times or 633 times 
uh, as of now over the last couple of days, but, but we will be publishing all of the edited uh, individual talks on YouTube in the coming days. So uh, yeah, feel free to follow us on YouTube uh, or Twitter, and I'll also drop links in, in the chat. Awesome. And that rounds out our spotlights. Over to Bertie and Steph for the awesome Lily performance optimizations. Hi, hey everyone. Uh, this is Bertie from Sentinel. Uh, today, we'll talk about how we made Lydia run 15 times faster. So just some background, Lydia is an essential software to, uh, for indexing the Filecoin blockchain. Uh, it provides data extraction and analysis compatibility. A few things that Lydia can do is to, for example, extracting blocks, message receipts, uh, and uh, the actor state changes such as minor sector events, market deals, uh, and uh, FEVN data. So the, the main problem with Lily previously was the, uh, the infra cost. And that's probably the, the top, um, uh, top complaint from our, from our users. Um, and because some certain tasks that requires uh, a lot of resources and time to process uh, the data. And uh, once the uh, time um, exceeds 30 seconds, because that's a, that's a duration of an epoch, then we, are, we will not be able to keep up with the chain um, so in this case, we need to process the task in parallel. We need to run multiple Lily, Lily nodes in order to keep up with the chain. Um, and this can increase the uh, infra cost significantly. So for example, a five node cluster uh, of Lily nodes will cost more than $10,000 a month. And uh, uh, in the past, one vendor uh, even quoted us uh, like 1.5 million for a two year support contract to operate Lily and uh, the database. So here's the diagram of the Lily architecture. So it is a specialized Lotus node. So it imports the uh, library from Lotus, IPOD, and uh, actors, et cetera. So the main components are the indexer, processors, and uh, the exporter. And here's a diagram of the distributed worker pattern. Uh, like what I mentioned, when we need to run multiple nodes, we need to set up um, um, this infrastructure. So it contains notifier, the message queue, and workers. So though this, um, this, this, this pattern will um, scale horizontally, uh, but it will get uh, expensive uh, really quickly. And uh, um, I, I was surprised when I saw this um, and um, it, it requires a distributed system in order to parse, uh, to extract Filecoin data. But I was told that it's because like uh, the, the state comparison between epochs is very expensive operation. Uh, although I'm not convinced, um, so I decided to look into it further. So we start investigating into uh, the performance bottleneck. So we, we try to start with the most uh, time consuming task, which involves like the market deal data. So you can see that here, uh, the task process duration for market deal proposal is more than one and a half minute. So we uh, enabled a, a tracing um, feature in Lily. So here's a simple trace for processing one tip set in Lily. So the total time spent for processing one tip set is one minute and 33 seconds. Uh, we spend most of the time uh, on deal proposal processor. And within a deal proposal processor, you can see uh, we're doing, we spend all the time doing AMT.div. So what does that mean? So AMT is an IPOD data structure uh, to store an array of data. And AMT.div is to compare the difference between two arrays. And then um, below that, we can see we also spend quite a quite amount of time on export data, uh, which is uh, the actor state. We spend 20 seconds to just process the actor state data. And uh, for the drill down, we, we, re, we realized that we're making one database call per row, uh, which is definitely not right, And but it's an easy fix. So in order to understand why it's so expensive to do the empty diff, uh, I reviewed the, the coding IPOD empty library and eventually discovered a bug in the library that's causing an unnecessary tree traversal. So in order to explain that, um, I draw a diagram to to demonstrate how we compare to two AMT arrays. So an AMT node, AMT is actually a tree structure. So each node will have links or the actual values. So the links will point to other um, AMT node and, and there's a CID associated with each link. And the values uh, are only stored on the leaf node. Uh, so you here we can, uh, think of the V1, V2 as the, the deal proposal. And so we have an array of deal proposal. And so we are comparing deal proposal between two epoch. We have a state one from previous epoch and state two for the current epoch. Um, so when we are comparing uh, the AMT, we look at a CID associated with, with the link first. 
So CID is calculated, it's a, it's a content uh, ID, right? So it's calculated based on the content of the subtree is pointing to. So if the CIDs are the same, it means that uh, the subtree has the exact same values. So we don't have to uh, compare it uh, further. So in this case, well, when you look at the, the first link in the root node, uh, we saw they're both CID1, so uh, we stop there. And then we look at on the other side, we saw CID2 and CID5. So we know that the content of a subtree uh, is, is different. So you have to find out the actual different value. We do it recursively and eventually we'll find out that uh, in one of the node, uh, the, the value V6 is changed to V7. Okay, so this is how uh, the MD div should work. But the bug I, well, I discovered is that uh, even though when the CID is, is the same, we try to we still try to navigate uh, down into all its children nodes. Uh, this is especially bad because that means we are loading uh, every node from the disk into memory and just to find out that uh, the values are the same in, in, in the end. So that ex explains the high CPU and IO usage uh, whenever it involves like a, a huge state uh, comparison. So a similar bug is also found in IPOD HEM library. Um, so the uh, fixes for um, both libraries are simple. And uh, we also optimize the state, actor state persistent uh, to batch insertion mechanism. So the result, um, the market deal proposal execution time reduced from 100 seconds to 0.5 seconds. Uh, actor state persistent time uh, reduced from 20 seconds to 0.2 seconds. The time to process one epoch reduced from 100 seconds to six seconds. Uh, this is especially, especially um, meaningful because once the process time for one epoch is, is lower, it's is, um, shorter than 30 seconds, we long, no longer need a um, cluster setting. Uh, so we can now run everything on one single instance. And uh, the amount of infra cost uh, is reduced from $10,000 to $1,000. And I think now um, everyone is, 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 is very affordable uh, for everyone who wants to run uh, UD nodes on their own. So next I will talk about impact, uh, I'll give it to Steph. Yeah, thanks Bertie. Um, so all of these Im massive improvements have resulted in very positive feedback from um, key Lily users such as Engram. Um, they are now able to use Lily and archival snapshots to backfill F FEVM data, specifically contracts data. Um, not only that, since Lily is uh, performant now, we can add more complex uh, processing tasks instead of doing this in a separate data processing pipeline, which I did previously to Bootstrap. So thank you to Terry for uh, baking that into Lily. So um, now our Lily node operators are able to do that themselves without having to create another um, service for just extracting contract data. Additionally, Starboard, um, another one of our key um, customers is also has been very satisfied with the performance and they expect that the cost of running Lily nodes will be more affor affordable for them going forward. Um, and that hopefully reduces the dependency between them and us. Um, moreover, um, uh, because of the um, reduced batch processing time, um, this also means uh, actual financial cost savings, not only for ourselves, but also for uh, node operators and actually also for our batch processing job that we have in flight at the moment. Here are some resources uh, from our team. Um, Birdie has written a write-up for the Lily performance optimization for people who are interested. Um, our, no our Notion page, um, our roadmap, and also we have uh, started a new RFC um, uh, documentation to better uh, collaborate with other teams and other PLN companies. And you can reach us on Phil Sentinel Slack channel as usual. Thank you. Awesome. Amazing, amazing work, Sentinel team, especially because this really helps increase resiliency across the entire ecosystem. The more people can afford to run these nodes and collect their own um, chain data, they run their own archival historical nodes, um, you know, back their own uh, RPC and analytics. Uh, the more resilient we are as a network and the um, you know, more accessible that data is for people to make informed um, decisions or back their own services. So phenomenal work um, and really excited to see the impact of that, not just on our own uh, budget, but on the many different folks who are now able to adopt. So great work. We're officially at time, but if anyone does have any questions, feel free to drop them um, in chat or flag. 
Um, otherwise, please do leave comments on the deck so that um, folks can follow up with you directly and get feedback on presentations for next time. Happy Thursday, everyone. Have a great one.